uh, one of the most uncomfortable moments in my entire life uh, came in December of 2004. I was uh, about a year into dating Tina, who is now my wife, uh, thank goodness, but uh, who was my girlfriend at the time. And it was a t stage in our relationship where I was beginning to be introduced to her extended family, okay? Now, if you know um, Tina's mom at all, Tina's mom is 100% Egyptian, okay? Born and raised in Cairo, and uh, she didn't step foot into the United States until she was 18 years old, okay? So when you think like my big fat Greek wedding, that was like <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the Levisi household, okay? Now, um, my family, on the other hand, uh, quite different. My dad was super into genealogies, and uh, as I was kind of going through his stuff, just preparing for his memorial service uh, a few months back, I, I found he was able to trace back our family lineage to this guy named Edward Bumpstead with a P. Our name got changed later. I'm not sure which one's better or worse, but it's a bad <laughs> last name in general. Anyway, it traced him back to 1555, where he was a registered member of the Church of England, okay? And uh, so that's, that's my family heritage. And then on my mom's side, she can trace family back to Norway, still has a cousin in, in Norway. And so Tina's family is loud, okay? My family is quiet. Tina fa came from a busy family of seven. I came from a simple and, and slow family of four. My only brother is 10 and a half years older than me, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and so I'm essentially an only child and the youngest child, which is, explains a lot, I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Tina uh, is an extrovert. I am a certified introvert. And Tina and I are classic case of like hot and cold climate cultures coming together, if you know anything about that. Relationship versus task-oriented, direct versus indirect communication, group identity versus individualism, event-oriented versus time-oriented, on and on and on, okay? In so many ways, we could not have started out our lives any more different, okay? But back to 2004. So I was invited to come uh, to a Christmas dinner party uh, to meet a whole bunch of her family members, okay? And I was legitimately scared out of my mind. Uh, this, le this legitimately felt like a test for me. Like, how much do I really love this girl, Tina? I've only known her a year. You know, I, I, there, I could cut bait right now. There are other fish in the Norwegian Sea, okay? <clears throat> uh, but uh, so, so we pull up to the street, and it's like crowded. The street is like you can't find a parking spot anywhere. Uh, and so we fi finally find a spot a good distance away, get out of the car, and I can just I can hear the roar of the party up ahead. Okay, and like I, I look in the distance and I think I see hookah smoke like bill billowing out of the windows of, of this house. And the closer we get, I can hear like the belly laughs of the, uh, of the Middle Eastern culture like bouncing off, echoing off the houses around us. Okay, so I finally get up to the, to the front door and by this time I'm like shaking. And uh, this is like the very last place I want to be. So I, I, get, I get to the front door and this man greets me and his name is Anoush. Mm -hmm. Anoush. Okay, so I assume right away Anoush is a part of the Egyptian mafia. It just has to be. <laughs> has to be. He's not a very tall man, but I can, I can tell by the way he shakes my hand that he's killed before. <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> and <laughs> I'll never forget, as serious as ever, he grabs my hand, looks me straight in the eye, and says, if you hurt her, I will kill you. <laughs> and like, that was legit. Like, it wasn't just like something you say. And then just in the classic way, he got this big smile on his face, pulled me in real tight, gave me a big hug, and then planted a big, fat, juicy, wet kiss right on my cheek, okay? Thank you, Anoush, for that introduction to the family. <clears throat> and that's the moment I knew I was gonna marry Tina. Right there. So, 17 years later, here we are, forever to the end. 
Well, we're in a message series called One Another, where we're looking at uh, uh, some of the key one another statements in the Bible. These are critical one, uh, uh, these statements in, as we build a framework for how we really experience community. Uh, as we know in this church, experience community is one of the three vision statements that we have as a church. So it's very important. We want to dive deep into this. But how exactly are we supposed to experience community in this day and age? And, and we're going to try to uncover that. Last week, Ken opened the series with Love One Another, and it was a great just introduction on how just this, this big overview of how, how we're just, love is to be the, the key cornerstone of our lives as we approach other people. Now today we're looking at a key scripture that says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And that's Romans 16, 16. Now I'm still not sure Anoush gave me a holy kiss. It was a kiss for sure, but it's holiness I still question to this day. But we're going to get more into the kiss thing in a second. Um, and, And what that has to do with biblical community, we'll wrestle with that. But just Just for a second, I need to ground us for a minute. I'm going to, I just have something I want to share. I found, as I was doing some study this week, uh, an article popped up actually in my newsfeed from The Atlantic that just so resonated with this series in general and this conversation of what really, uh, what biblical community really means. I want to, I want to summarize it for us. And it's called The Misunderstood Reasons, Reason Why Millions of Americans Stopped Going to Church. Okay. Okay. I wish I, had, I wish I had time to read the whole thing to you. It's really not that long anyway. I'll do my best to summarize. And this article is linked. So if you go to the Bible app or if you go on npfcc.org media, you find the message notes. The link to this article, I'd love for you to check it out, is available. And uh, you can read it on your own time. But it was written by a guy named Jake Meter, and he's not uh, an unbeliever. This is not a secular perspective written, uh, you know, outside written in, looking in. This is an insider. He's a Christian, follower of Jesus, uh, just looking at what the church needs to do um, to, to, to help this issue that we're struggling with right now. This is how he starts the article. He says, nearly everyone I grew up with in my childhood church in Lincoln, Nebraska, is no longer Christian. That's not unusual. 40 million Americans have stopped attending church in the past 25 years. That's something like 12% of the population. And it represents the largest concentrated change in church attendance in American history. As a Christian, I feel this shift acutely. My wife and I wonder whether the institutions and communities that have helped preserve us in our own faith will still exist for our four children, let alone whatever grandkids we might one day have. In short, the church in America is shrinking, and it's shrinking fast. Many of us know that. A few of us are still oblivious to it. But that reality demands our attention. And now there are so many reasons why this is the case. Uh, It's not just one thing. It's this collision of societal and cultural factors that are causing more people to stop attending church than ever. But one of the factors the author points out is that uh, the, the, the church is no longer compatible with the work culture in America. Okay, so, so check this out. This is the quote. Contemporary America simply isn't set up to promote mutuality, care, or common life. Rather, it is designed to maximize individual accomplishment as defined by professional and financial success. Such a system leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's own professional life. Workism reigns in America. And because of it, community in America, religious community included, is a math problem that doesn't add up. Essentially, he's arguing that with the rise of hyper-individualism, consumerism, uh, the need for more and better driven by uh, advertisement and social media uh, comparison has left Americans hustling hard. We are overtired, exhausted, busy, and anxious. And this is even more true in California, right, where it takes two to hustle to pay the mortgage or the rent. And I, I, it's, it, it's not that people don't believe in God anymore uh, necessarily, um, it's, it's that we've let the world steal and replace our version of the good life. We're trading meaning for success and for some just simply survival. And where possibly the Christian church needs to take some blame for this or, or at least look at ourselves in the mirror is that we haven't modeled for people what life in Christ really looks like. Because following Jesus, Ken said this last week, following Jesus should be the antidote in a society filled with selfishness, anxiety, depression, fear, and hate. It absolutely should be. 
This article affirms that. It says, the one thing our culture needs more than anything right now is, quote, a community marked by sincere love, sharing what they have from each according to their ability and to each according to their need, eating together regularly, generously serving neighbors, and living lives of quiet virtue and prayer. The church should be the solution. The article goes on, the tragedy of American churches is that they have been so caught up in this same world that we now find they have nothing to offer those suffering people that can't be more easily found somewhere else. Too often, the church has not been a community that through its preaching and living bears witness to another way to live. There's a lot more to say about this, but in short, it's possible, the, the, the article argues, that the church hasn't been asking too much of people, but maybe we've actually been asking too little of people. Because the way of Jesus isn't something that you can just tack onto an already over-busy life. Jesus is not a life hack, even though some churches treat him as such. Following Jesus in a way that actually leads to life requires a replacement, a sacrifice of the things that are keeping us on that crazy wheel and, and, and taking up the things that give us peace. The article closes with this. Churches could model better, truer sorts of communities Ones in which the hungry are fed, the weak are lifted up, and the proud are cast down. Such communities might not have the money, success, and influence that, influence that many American churches have so often pursued in recent years. But if such communities look less like those churches, they might also look more like the sorts of communities Jesus expected his followers to create. Too long, didn't listen. In my, uh, in my summary, biblical community is one of the major solutions to the problem with the church in America. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to figure out how to experience this kind of community in this message and in the messages to come. So with that in mind, keep that in the back of your mind. Now we're going to talk about how Kissing each other is a big uh, part of that solution. Okay, let's go. Uh, we went to uh, went on a missions trip to Chile back in 2001 or 2002. I can't remember at the moment. But uh, my, my good friend, Dellen Berry, some of you know him. He used to attend here uh, a, a long time ago. Uh, he went with us. And uh, we went to the Chilean church where they are a warm weather culture, right? Uh, much like my Egyptian moth family, my Egyptian family. Um, <laughs> And they're a very, very warm culture. So, so they had a greeting time, like we have a greeting time, and they literally kissed each other. And so these like young girls came up to Dellen and gave uh, him a kiss on the cheek. And if you you have to know Dellen, like his face turned as red as his hair, and and so he just but he just ate it up. And he turned to Ken and he just said, "I think I'm gonna like it here." <laughs> There's something to say about that, right? The, the early church and in a lot of other churches still to this day around the world was a kissing church. In total, the New Testament encourages us to give one another a holy kiss or the kiss of love, as it says in other places. It says, says that five times specifically. And then there are several other uh, examples of kissing uh, in that context in Scripture. And we know from history that this holy kiss, at the very least, was introduced in the regular gathering of, of the followers of Christ by 150 A.D., most likely way earlier than that, but that's what we have record of uh, historically. Now, we don't need to spend a ton of time on the kiss itself. I think that's actually kind of self-explanatory. It's not rocket science, right? A kiss is a kiss. There's some unique cultural layers to it, of course, but uh, it still does, does now, as it did then, communicate affection, love, belonging, intimacy, all that, right? In, in general, you don't kiss somebody uh, that, that, is not, uh, that you don't know or you don't care about or is not a part of your circle or your group. A kiss is a sign of the relationship that already exists, right? Right? Some of you guys may know this. Tina and I didn't even kiss on the lips until we got married. And uh, now that I actually think about it, that was probably because of Anoush. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But, but at the time, we really, we really wanted to reserve that part of our relationship for later because it meant something. It was significant. But a kiss communicates that a relationship is that it exists. And here's why the holy kiss is significant in the New Testament. It's because one of the biggest issues in Jesus' ministry and in the early church was the issue of inclusion of the outsider, okay? Paul may not have spent multiple chapters explaining the kiss. This holy kiss thing is really an aside. It comes like at the very end of almost all the chapters that it's featured in, and it's kind of like at the, at the end of the letter as his final exhortations to the people, it's small. But he does go into detail on unity between Jew and Gentile, those inside established religion and those outside established religion. Unity between um, uh, those inside and outside. Likewise, Jesus spent the majority of his ministry redefining who should be in and who should be out, right? Choosing the disciples alone was a a massive example of Jesus's redefinition of those boundaries. And so when Paul throws in at the end of a letter Uh, written to a church that's still kind of wrestling through this issue of disunity, that church hears, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now that command, as short and seemingly sweet as it is, has a bit more weight to it. Now you have to understand that before Jesus, Jews would never greet a Gentile with a kiss. Jews were a very, very culturally tight and exclusive community, and a kiss would imply that you are one of my people, and they were not about that. Um, they, you are their people only if you looked like them, talked like them, believed like them, grew up where they grew up, and so on. So Paul, check this out, fast forward after Jesus, writes one of the most compelling and beautiful expositions on unity of Jew and Gentile in the whole Bible. I just would love to take some time to read this passage. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It'll be on the screens. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. But check, check this, this out, this story out of this, uh, this picture of unity. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, essentially those on the inside were were calling the Gentiles the uncircumcised. It was this label that divided them. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, like you were excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope, without God in the world, because the Jews kept it to themselves. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. I love that language there, the dividing wall of hostility. You have to see it. You have to visualize it to understand what Paul is talking about. Here is a picture of uh, the temple courts. Now, you see this, this outer big wall. The Gentiles were allowed inside that outer space. However, you see those two kind of like lines of stone on the left and the right of the temple in the middle? If a Gentile were to cross that line, they were threatened with their very life, Okay. This inscription was found on a pillar in A.D. 1871 as archaeologists who were excavating the site found this. It was written on one of these pillars. No man of another nation is to enter within the fence and enclosure around the temple, and whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death ensues. That was a dividing wall of hostility. And Jesus destroyed that sucker. <laughs> Amen? So, so it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose, as Jesus' purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body, his body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, to which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those of you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And then he closes the loop here. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners 
and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Is that not one of the most beautiful descriptions of the power of Jesus to destroy hate and segregation and pride and elitism? Only Jesus could have transformed the hearts of a people who three days before would have killed a Gentile for entering the Jewish courts. But now after the resurrection, they're kissing each other as they gather together to break bread. Jesus made family out of foreigners. So when Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss to a church made up of Jew and Gentile, all this, right, is packed into there. It's pretty hard to still have a wall of hostility up when you're kissing somebody. Now, to the two people who know this truth but are still sitting on opposite sides of the church, greet one another with a holy kiss kind of is a real challenge. To the, to the person who still can't help but harbor a little piece of racism in their heart, greet one another with a holy kiss as a reminder that their discipleship to Jesus is still in progress. For those who have been hurt by another follower of Jesus and are still working out how to forgive, greet one another with a holy kiss just lands a little differently. And thankfully, Juan's going to tackle that topic next week on forgiveness. But when it all, when it all boils down, so this kissing thing It's a unity thing. It's an inclusion thing. It's a welcome thing. And it's something that the Bible calls, it's translated in English, hospitality. And so that's what we're going to spend just the rest of our short time together talking about this idea of hospitality. Now, I need to pause and mention that uh, kind of the rest of this message is kind of an amalgamation of a whole bunch of stuff that I have listened to that I have linked to, again, in the Bible app and in the message notes online. I would love for you to check this out. It's a seven-part podcast series all about uh, this topic that I'm going to kind of cram into just like 20 minutes. And, uh, but it, it has totally redefined and, and brought my own perspective to life and how we are to do community. And so if you're looking just kind of for something extra, I highly encourage you to check that out. It's a podcast series by John Mark Comer and his church Bridgetown as a part of uh, their their effort to practice the way of Jesus in their community. And uh, this whole series is about hospitality. So let's dive into this uh, just real quick. The Greek word for hospitality is the word philoxenia. And this is a compound word, philo, which means love. Some of you might recognize that as one of the four Greek words for love, right? There's agape, which means unconditional love. Eros means erotic love. Storge means compassionate love. Philo means brotherly love, right? So essentially family love. And then xenia is just the word for stranger, outcast, refugee, outsider, visitor, okay? And so combined, it means to make a stranger family, right? That's what it means, to love a stranger like family, to love a foreigner like family. And so our word like hospitality is a little weak when you really think about the the significance of the word phylloxenia, but that's the word in English we have, so we're going to go with it. Uh, But it's really significant. Now, the opposite, you might be thinking, you, you might heard that word xenia before, you might heard of the word xenophobia, it's kind of been a hot topic issue over the last few years. It's the fear of the stranger or the foreigner, right? This has no place in the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus has no place for this word, this concept, this idea, this kind of fear uh, for the follower of Jesus. Author uh, Rosaria Butterfield, who I'll quote again later, an amazing story she has, uh, defines hospitality as turning strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. Love that. John Mark Comer defines hospitality as expressing the welcome of God the Father to all through tangible acts of love, ideally through the giving of food, shelter, and relationship. And the Bible commands us over and over to practice phylloxenia, or hospitality. Hebrews 13, 1 through 3 says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Ken talked about that last week. And then it goes on, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. 
For by doing so, some may have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Crazy. Don't have time to get all into that. But then here comes like an extension of hospitality. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 9 says, Above all, love each other deeply. Again, here comes hospitality. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Uh, I love that little ad because honestly, the truth is, is that hospitality isn't always comfortable. If we practice phylloxenia the right way, we're going to have to love people that are a little hard to love. And I just may just encourage us a little bit, just like Sarah Beth shared with, you know, inviting the boys to her table and loving those who are hard to love. If we are not ever uncomfortable when we are loving people, we're probably not loving people like Jesus, or we're probably not loving people the kind of people that Jesus chose to go out of his way to love. If you haven't been uncomfortable, if you're not loving people that are hard to love, if, if you love people who can only pay you back, you're not loving like Jesus. Philoxenia is an extension and might cause you to grumble a little bit at times. You might have that natural tendency that this is uncomfortable for me. You know you're in the right place if that's what you feel. There's another scripture, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 3. It says, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not vile, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Veronica, in our announcement video this morning, mentioned that this scripture is actually one of the requirements to be an elder at our church. We're taking suggestions, right? And so it's, it's crazy to think that Somebody might be disqualified if you struggle with alcohol on a regular basis, right? Or uh, have a, a family that's, that's, that's crazy, or you're violent, or you're quarrelsome, or you're greedy. But have we ever, like, disqualified somebody for not inviting a stranger over to your house for, por- for pulled pork, right? I, I, I don't know if that's been a, a disqualification uh, for somebody. But it's in the list. It's right there. And I think it's because it's so significant. It's such a meaningful part of uh, the gospel of Christ. And we're going to find out why in a minute. Now, let me paint a picture for you. Hospitality uh, it, it is really the primary way to show hospitality, especially in the first century, was by food, okay? Uh, Jesus put into this into practice over and over and over, and his primary way was a meal. This is, uh, it's inviting a stranger into your home with open arms, providing them food and company and kindness and warmth. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it's also offering them hope and purpose and encouragement. Jesus, again, he did this constantly throughout his three-year ministry. Now, you might be thinking, um, Devin, Jesus was homeless. He surely didn't invite people into his house, right? You're right, but he's Jesus, so he just invited himself over to other people's houses. And he did that over and over and over again. It was just Wonderful. And it's the best example for any of us who are like single or still living with our parents or have an apartment full of three like gnarly dudes and your house isn't the most hospitable place. That's fine. Jesus set the example. Invite yourself over to somebody else's house. Done. It's good. Remember, that, remember the story of Zacchaeus, right? He looks at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, I must come to your house today. And that was like literally true, not just because it was Jesus's mission, because Jesus is like, I don't have a house. I got, can I come over? I need to come over. I don't have anywhere else to go. So I'm going to go to your place. But Jesus is constantly doing this. He's constantly eating and drinking with people throughout the Gospels. In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, there's 94 references to Jesus and food. 50 references in the Gospel of Luke uh, to Jesus and food. I found an author by the name of Robert Karras this week. He has a a book called Eating Your Way Through Luke's Gospel. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek book, uh, but he traces all the times food and and Jesus are, are together, and he traces this amazing theme. And he just says this, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. That's it. This was a huge part of Jesus's life and ministry. Okay, so you're like, cool, Jesus ate a lot, so what? It's not how often he ate or or what he ate. It's all about who he ate with. Because just like the kissing thing, a respected rabbi literally wouldn't be caught dead 
eating and drinking with the kinds of people that Jesus ate and drank with. That story, Zacchaeus, that flannel graph that we grew up with is doing us a disservice as adults because this isn't some fun, cute story with a wee little man and a nice little song. Jesus is inviting himself over to a a Roman oppressor's home to eat with him. That would have been a vile scandal in the first century. No rabbi ever did this, nor would a respectable rabbi ever do this. And yet Jesus did this kind of thing over and over and over with the rich, the poor, the oppressed, the oppressors, women, prostitutes, children, the lame, basically every outsider, every outcast, every refugee, everyone who wasn't welcomed by the religious elite, Jesus went out of his way to offer phylloxenia, hospitality, family love to those who had been cast aside. Also, something fascinating in the book of Luke, there's this parallel. Uh, This phrase, the son of man came, happens twice in, in the book of Luke. That exact phrase, once in Luke 19, which many of us actually know because it's part of our mission statement here as as a church, and another time in Luke 7. Now in Luke 19, the Son of Man came line describes Jesus' mission, what he came on earth to do. And does anyone know what this verse is, the Son of Man came to, a little Bible trivia for you? Anybody? Anybody? Ah, seek and save the lost. Yes, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is our uh, part of a, that's a, that's a longer part of our mission statement now. Uh, we, we shortened it. We used to call it developing fully devoted followers of Christ who seek and save the lost. Now it's helping people find and follow Jesus. But the, the, the point is the same, that we have adopted Jesus' mission. And so, again, there's two times this, this phrase comes out, the Son of Man came. The first is uh, likely pointing to Jesus' mission. This is what he came to do. But what was Jesus' method? What was his method for seeking and saving the lost? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever really stopped to consider, consider what was Jesus' primary stratagem for seeking and saving the lost? Well, that, as some commentators have suggested, might very well be answered in this other, the Son of Man came to, found in Luke 7. And that says in verse 34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. (laughs) And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Luke 19 describes the mission. Luke 7 describes the method. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. We get that, and we're on board with that as a church, right? But how did he seek and save the lost? By eating and drinking, and especially eating and drinking with those who he might be labeled a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He sought and saved the lost one outcast at a time, one meal at a time, one table at a time. Now, just a thought, if we're taking up Jesus' mission, why aren't we taking up Jesus' method? So really, ask yourself, when you think of the word, like evangelism, let's go there for a second, right? Evangelism, what comes to your mind? Like, when you, the first thought that pops into your mind when you think of evangelism, what is that to you? Now, to me, like, that word evangelism is, ah, it's like kind of that icky word, right? I have that bad reaction because it's kind of like, I just think of, like, mean signs and soapboxes and door-to-door and, like, really lame Facebook posts. And, but when you think of, like, what comes to your mind when you think of that? My real challenge for us today is simply this. What if the first thing you thought about when you think about evangelism is not a church building but a dining table? What if the first thing we thought about when we think of phylloxenia, hospitality, is not the selection of treats laid out on the information counter out there? As good as that is, and the Ecklands put a ton of work into that, and we love that, and we need that. But what if the first thing that came to your mind was the charcuterie board on your kitchen counter instead? Now, I know this seems a little basic, and in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't, because we haven't been practicing it very well. But what if we've just been thinking about evangelism all backwards? What if the first place your neighbor experienced the welcome of God was around your fire pit in your backyard, not rows in a church building? Now, do we want them to come here? 
Duh, yes, abs- absolutely. Can they find the, the, the message of the gospel here? I sure, I sure hope so. Yes, of course. But w- just what if, what if that was step two, right? What if that was step two instead of step one? And what if we're really supposed to take up Jesus' mission and his method? His method was radically ordinary hospitality, a phrase that was coined by Rosaria Butterfield. And uh, another quote she she's, uh, has in, in this amazing book uh, she wrote called the, the Gospel Comes with a House Key. And uh, the, the, this is the quote, radically ordinary hospitality, those who live it see strangers as neighbors and neighbors as family of God. They recoil at reducing a person to a category or a label. They see God's image reflected in the eyes of every human being on earth. Those who live that radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. (laughs) How many of you see your homes like that? (laughs) They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. Now, Ken uh, hinted at this last week. I'm just going to double up on it a bit. Historians believe um, that, that, this, that this idea, hospitality around table fellowship, evangelism through smoked lamb, right? It, it's how the gospel spread at such a rapid pace. Think about it. How did this tiny little sliver of a sect of Judaism, this tiny little gathering in an upper room in Jerusalem on the outskirts of the Roman Empire, rise to such a power three centuries later that it became the dominant religion of the day? How did it become the new normal that over half of the Roman Empire was in some way, shape, or form a Christian or a follower of Jesus to the point where it toppled paganism. Anyone worshiping Zeus today still? Toppling Caesar himself. How did this happen? With no internet, no cell phones, no YouTube, no church buildings. For the most part, church was illegal. No religious freedom, no celebrity pastors, not a single follower on Instagram. How did this happen? The gospel spread from one home to the next, one table to the next, all over bread and wine. The practice of eating and drinking is central to the way of Jesus. This was at the very vanguard of evangelism. And I think we've lost it these days. I know I have. Hyper-individualism, the move from the front yard to the backyard, right? The invention of the garage door opener, curse that thing. The dawn of Netflix, right, and social media. We've lost the practice as a central way to the life of Jesus. What if we recaptured radically ordinary hospitality? Now, how do we do this here at MPFCC? And this is simple, and we're going to be hounding this (laughs) the next five weeks. We do it through life groups. That's our expression of this. It's our primary expression of how we experience community. Now, can you experience community by coming here on a Sunday morning? Oh, man, really? Really? Okay. We, let's debate about that. Let's talk about that later. I'm going to just say no. Not the way the Bible describes it. We don't have enough time. It's not uncomfortable enough. <laughs> You don't have to sacrifice anything by coming here and sitting in rows. You don't have to welcome a stranger or neighbor into your house. You don't have to smoke pulled pork for 12 hours here. You don't have to make space in a bedroom here. You don't have to wash the stinky clothes of someone who comes in from the outside here. Can you experience it? In a part, yes, okay, yes, of course. Of course you can. You can feel the warmth. You can feel the, the inclusion. You can, you can get a glimpse of phylloxenia by coming here on a Sunday morning, but you will never experience the full measure of it without being in a deeply intimate circle, getting out of the rows 
and getting into a circle where people know your junk and love you anyway. And where that circle isn't closed, but it's open to those who are suffering around you. Now, some of you may have not had the greatest experience with life groups. I totally get that. Nor have I, right? And, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe the life group wasn't a good fit. Maybe you have three crazy children who are six, six, and eight years old, and bringing them to a life group is just like t- pulling your teeth out. I get it, okay? I get it. Um, life groups are hard, but maybe that's the point. And some of you are way too busy for life groups because workism reigns in America. Sports, work, overtime, your side hustle has dominated your schedule, and you have no place for deep community in your life. And simply adding a life group to your already over-busy schedule will suck for you. I promise you that. Um, it, It will stress you out so bad. You will come to it exhausted with nothing to give. And it will mean less. And if that's you, I, I encourage you not just to add a life group to your already over busy life. I encourage you to pray. Get on your knees and pray, God, would you give me the strength to give something up so I can take this in its place? So I actually have the time and the space and the energy for it in my soul. Now listen, our church isn't perfect at life groups, nor will we ever be. We have a lot of work to do. We're working on it. Life groups will always be messy because you are in them, okay? It's your fault anyway. (laughs) So, but that, again, that's a part of the transformative work, right? To bear one another's burdens in love for unlike people to come together, for strangers to become neighbors and neighbors to become family. Now, if you're looking for an on-ramp to life groups, Rooted is the perfect opportunity now, don't mistake this for some just like program or, or thing we do. It is a really, really beautiful 10-week experience where you get together with other believers and start this practice. But it's guided in such a way uh, that it really just facilitates this, this mingling. It teaches you just amazing core truths about Jesus and the Bible and the Holy Spirit and the church and your giftedness and all of that. It wraps it all together and, and then allows you to launch into a life group from there. We're going to start our rooted group soon here in uh, just the middle of September. So if you're interested, check that out. Go on the patio after service. We'd love to chat with you about a life group or getting involved in rooted. It is so, so important for us to experience community together here in this church. Let me remind you of that, the ending quote of that article. Jake Meter closed that article with this. He said, churches could model better, truer sorts of communities, ones in which the hungry are fed, the weaker lifted up, and the proud are cast down. Such communities might not have the money, success, and influence that many American churches have so often pursued in recent years, but if such communities look less like those churches, they might also look like, more like the sorts of communities Jesus expected his followers to create. We can do this here. We can do it. One life group at a time one table at a time, making family out of a bunch of strangers, living the way of Jesus, probably awkwardly at times, but together. Um, Remember Anoush, kiss of death guy? I literally, I literally just found out this week, I didn't even know it, as like, I wrote most of the message and then I found out later. He's not family. He's not biologically related to to the Levesey family. Just a friend. But he understood that you don't have to be family to be family. And he loved me as a stranger, and he loved me as his very own, and that's exactly what Jesus did by dying on the cross for us. He brought us who were far away and made us members of his household, as it says in Ephesians 2, fellow citizens, no longer foreigners and strangers, built on the foundation of the apostles. And now we get to be built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So we're going to take communion today, and I want you to just get it ready right right here and right now. We're going to end a little bit differently today. And uh, the early church, for the early church, celebrating communion was, was not a little cracker and not a little cup. 
It was a full-blown meal lasting hours and hours going into the night, celebrating and feeding those who couldn't feed themselves, feeding the poor, allowing the rich to come and contribute to those who, who couldn't afford food themselves. It was a blend of Jew and Gentile together, breaking the same loaf of bread, symbolizing their unity that they had in Christ. The early church called this the love feast, right? It was a celebration. It was a party. It was a welcome. Philip Yancey has this great quote that I'll close with. It says this, This table is different. It isn't where sinners find Christ, but where sons and daughters celebrate being found. Maybe someday, instead of solemnly making our way to the tables, we should dance for joy. (laughs) Maybe we should sing every born-again song we know. Maybe we should tell our homecoming stories and laugh like people who no longer fear death. Maybe we should ask if anyone wants seconds (laughs) and hold our little cups high to toast to lost sinners found and dead brothers and sisters alive. Amen to that. So let's take the bread And let's toast to the unified body of Christ together. And let's raise our little glasses and toast to the maker of heaven and earth dying on the cross for us. So that we could be unified as one family under his amazing family. Let's stand together. We're going to sing in just a moment. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you for being our Heavenly Father. Thank you for coming to earth, dying to be with us, that we are now family of God, that we are with you together. Unify us, God, and give us the call and the passion, God, to form communities that would indeed change the world. We love you. We bless you. We worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's celebrate together. Thank you for joining us online, whether you're watching on Sunday or throughout the week. It's amazing we have the ability to connect together online, but we want to extend to you an official invitation to join us in person here at our Newbury Park campus. We would love the chance to meet you, help you get connected, and grow with a community of believers. Share with us that you're watching or how we can be praying for you. You can learn more about ministries and events happening here at the church and sign up for our weekly newsletters by filling out our Connect card. You can find the link to the Connect card in the description below. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, subscribe and turn on notifications for when each week's live stream is about to begin or the week's sermon has been posted and you can find Pastor Ken's weekly update videos. We believe giving is a big part of worship and we'd like to invite you to live generously with us here at MPFCC. If you've benefited from our live streams and services, would you consider giving back to God a portion of what he has provided and stepping in to seeing his kingdom grow in and through MPFCC? Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon.